you do want these pillows to be no smaller than this mm -hmm. okay you want enough to where like they can shift and you know it can't just be like a little circle that also can have the added value of like a place to rest a hand and stuff like that so <clears throat> They get themselves turned amazing so we would have been halfway through and now we're just replicating everything that we did and like anything it will just feel a little bit um odd at first to be trying to mirror everything that you did from one side of the table or in one position to the other because you're just flipping the use of your arms all the way and you're going to feel naturally less coordinated with one arm versus the other okay here at the head, we get to just make contact. Yeah. And figure out your orientations here. Don't poke them in the eye, but you know, contact over the <laughs> contact I mean, over the forehead. The other right? <laughs> contact pretty much on the forehead, just above the brow. That's on the frontal bone. So those muscles are called frontalis, and then the occipital bone, which is at the, you know, kind of the base-ish of the skull, but it's above the base of the skull. And that's at the occipitals. And just give it a little push, push and pull. It's a sandwich. It's technical terms. <laughs> How's that? Good. I try to reinforce that so that you're actually not having your hands slip. What tends to hurt therapists relative to doing the needing action is they slip too much and they're twisting to the point that their fingers, their wrists, and their elbows are kind of doing this real, like, unstable, repetitive action. And so it's needing that tends to give therapists thumb, wrist injuries, and will even translate up, like you mentioned, golfers or tennis elbow, will cause that kind of a symptom. If you just slow it down and make it more mechanical by really giving yourself more to push into, more to pull with, and learn to be able to create this static push and pull. And you can turn that into a twist, but you can make it nice and slow rather than this repeated, like red kneading kind of action, right? So just here, it just has to be a push and pull. We don't even, wouldn't even create a big slip and slide. With the scalp though, you can kind of plant as much of your hand and your fingers down and then try to just grip the skin and move the scalp. You don't want to be sliding. You just want to be trying to kind of pull the tissue usually away from the ear and then kind of pull maybe a little bit and then give them a surprise face and like lift the brow up <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but mobilizing the tissue of the scalp <laughs> and the more you see the ear move and the more you see their eyebrows move the better the job you're doing <laughs> so it can be scrunchy face and then it can be happy face Yeah, people love that though. Really? That and yeah, it's really, oh yeah. Stuff on the side of your ears. It's having a tough time. People are like, oh. staying in the position. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Okay, so after we've scrunched around, you know, there's the other orientation. Line your hand up with the zygomatic bone. We call the cheekbone. But you see how my, my outside of my palm sits right there. It should just feel like your fingers are resting towards the back of their skull and your palm is just resting right against their temples above their ear. You see those big temporalis muscles painted on there? Mm -hmm. There's frontalis and there's those occipitals. Mm -hmm. So that'll give you a, a general gauge. Let's go ahead and run away. Make sure 
Sure, anybody know? Not anything else, but. Now here, we just maintain contact, top of the skull. This is where um, we can start working on the neck. And in general, when working here, your, your, your best option is to take the time to step uh, down here and have the person bring their arm out on top of the sheet. Unless they really can't do it, it's just going to be way better for you to have them do it because you want to be reaching under the sheet near the chest and everything up in the armpits. It's just have them do it. Then there's options like this. Even if we didn't have the towel, for example, we could take the sheet, find the edge of the sheet on the one side. It can't even just be along the border and tuck that underneath their head. I like to keep it from pulling it off. I guess. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Come on. Here. <laughs> That's how it would be so much easier. Uh, just toss it up. Yeah. Now it doesn't have to be all the way, all the way. Now I don't use this one all the time, but you can see how that keeps it a little bit tighter yeah. against the chest. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's an option. All right. We're here. Let's reacquaint ourselves with the cervical spine. Just stabilizing the head. Make sure you're standing behind their head a little bit so that you're oriented. You don't want to be too lined up with their shoulder. Stand behind their ear a little bit. And then you can use your palm here, but the wrist angle is pretty awkward. One option of working on the neck in this orientation is a soft fist, but it's all going to come back around to how great the forearm is. You just don't want to be standing like this where you're lined up directly where like their ear and their shoulder in line. You got to step behind and that way when you bring your application in, it's going to keep you more on the posterior side of their body. You don't want to be a lateral. You want to be a bit posterior. Looks great. And now your clients look like their shoulders are in good alignment. But if they were to flop on you or really twist or roll, then that can become a problem, right? If they really crunch and roll that way, it can offset the alignment. So you might have to take their arm, put it on the sides of their body. Their whole hand doesn't have to be down, but their humerus should be more or less on the side of the body. That way the scapula is in a pretty good position where it keeps the neck in a neutral, neutral orientation. There you go, forearm for the upper shoulder. It's a lovely thing. Now, if we're feeling a little bit braver, bring it up near the neck. Keep your elbow angle pretty uh, small. Acute. Acute. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Keep your elbow angle acute. That way, you're contacting just the muscle <coughs> back of the neck. It would be surprising. Now, I know it seems scary like you're dropping yeah. like a wrestling elbow on somebody's <laughs> neck, but it works really good. Most of my neck massage looks like this. It starts at the shoulder and then works it my, its way up <laughs> the neck. Like this. It's just like, I'm right. doing that. That's doing it by itself. <laughs> then we can reset, super round. Stabilize the scapula and shoulder, kind of as one. Let your hand make contact with the neck and then just work your way up. Sometimes the hair will get a little bit in the way and you might have to kind of turn this more into a rhythmic compression. So you want to make contact with the tissue of the neck and then go all the way up, bless it. Go all the way up, bless <laughs> And go all the way up to the base of the skull. I wouldn't really want to see that happen, but <laughs> certainly, certainly we're applying some good stress. Like, ah. you should see his jaw from here. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, how much are you depressing the scapula? 
I'm more holding it still. Okay. Rather than that's a good that's a good clarifying a question. Rather than me pulling a lot, I'm just okay. kind of maybe I pull a little bit to just get it in a good orientation. But then I'm just holding it there, and I'm not applying any additional pull. I'm just trying to stabilize and fix it, and then the stress should be just up into the base of the skull, and that'll create the lengthening. And you can kind of play with just rhythmically changing that real small, like you're at the base of the skull, but just change your placement just a little bit, and then go back in. Change the placement a little bit, and another compression. It's working really good. Brain release. So great. And since it's, everybody's pretty well aligned, so let's give it, now we're not going to apply a lot of force, but I just want to have you feel and see kind of the orientation of this, where right where your palm was, you're behind the ear, right? See where your hand is? Yeah. Thumb's right behind the ear. That's exactly where you'd want the forearm to be placed. Starting at the neck and then just coming up a little bit to the base. And don't apply a lot of force yet, but go ahead. I mean, everybody's doing so good. Yeah, that looks great. That's not scary. The forearm works better. You know, it's a broader base of compression. Mm -hmm. You get an awful lot done. And the way my applications tend to start is I'll start here, and then when we have lotion, I'll just glide right at the base of the skull, and then sink in. I always do a pressure check in some of these sensitive areas. Right, once I make contact and I start applying force, and it's like, okay, this area can be sensitive, we're gonna slowly sink in. You tell me when the pressure is just perfect. They always have that stated for the client until I really know their body well. There you go. Now for shoulder movement stuff, we're already in position to just bring our hand underneath. So my left hand is underneath a left shoulder. Right hand, making contact with the scapula. You can play with this in a variety of ways. I can be just below that inferior angle or I can be higher up, but really the whole goal here is just to roll that scapula around. I can even apply some forces if I bring my hand lower down. I can kind of play with making the scapula do this a little bit. Just kind of try to get it to rotate a bit back and forth. And just make these things nice and slow. And at one point you can even grab hold. Make sure it's kind of real broad with your fingers. And you can do like a nice lean back. Might have to let me get my feet set. And bend both knees. To the point that it feels like you're kind of beginning, like here, you know, the neck is such that it would be lifting the head up. You can create a little bit of a stretch that way. Wow. <laughs> right. Now let's uh, continue where we're just palpating, confirming where the ribs are. The arm may be in the way, but we're gonna have to move it a little bit forward. Um, certainly another option for with sideline. This is where when you have more pillows, it can be nice because you could give, give them a pillow to hug. And that could create some additional support, keep them better aligned, more stable, but it's just another thing. But when you have your office or you have stuff that you're using, that's where the value of that second pillow or even a third, and a good size, like a standard one, you can really just be hugging it. Helps with draping, you don't have to worry about the chest as much. And then it has the added value of somewhere a bit more comfy for their arms to go. All right, finding the lower ribs, top of the pelvis. We want to stand in such a way where we are looking more towards their knee on an angle. As we bring a forearm in, We'll bump into the top of the pelvis, the iliac crest. And we don't want to push into that. We want to use that as a guide. So we find that, and then we want our pressure to go more straight down toward the table. Is that right? Yeah. As long as there's no stress on the ribs. So now as you are 
beginners in this, where you, you can confirm as you say with a client, especially if they've never had, you know, this application or been even worked on in styling before, I could just say, okay, we're gonna work on this low back area for you, but I wanna confirm that we're not putting stress on the lower ribs. So as I do it, then I say, all right, everything feeling good, ribs doing okay, and they'll say, yep. Because it will sometimes feel like you're kind of squashing them a little bit, but this direction and force, you're very safe. Can anybody think of a person with a condition where I might be especially cautious though? Pregnancy. Pregnancy, I wouldn't do this because we're distorting the abdominal the wall too much. Squash I have to make sure that I'm further back working on the muscles just by the spine, not over here. So very good. So that's the biggest one. And then also, uh, this is one of the cases where with osteoporosis, you'd be a little bit careful. All right, that will become very valuable. Now to, to give you a, a cool window into muscle energy and how all this stuff is so important, Get your forearm placed in there. Mild compression, go ahead and deliver pressure to client's comfort and or just your comfort level, okay? Mm -hmm. Now clients, I want you, this is a very slow action. Don't do anything big and explosive. Just start to lift your bottom leg up off the table. Feel all those low back muscles mm -hmm. kick on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so that's how I could use a co-contraction from a different area of the body to affect the low back muscles without actually having a person move the muscles, move their low back directly. Mm -hmm. Crazy. It's an amazing thing. Do you have somebody where you want to figure out what to do for them? Compression plus movement. In this case, it's compression plus active movement in order to cause the muscles that we're compressing to increase in tone. Mm -hmm. And then we have them hold that, they let go, and our combined action of the compression plus that action usually is what causes what people call a release. Get the muscle to return to more of a normal resting leg. That's muscle energy techniques usually. Compress, compression plus movement, usually active. But if you want a really super safe, amazing one that you can start using on your people, there it is. The way you might see it, you might have heard uh, them talking about it over here. Um, sometimes this is called, if you come more directly lateral, straight down a quadratus lumborum release, which is this particular muscle deep in there. But there's more than just that muscle. Your, your abdominal muscles, all your low back muscles, even so as it all interfaces along a seam here. So you can get everything really cool right there. All right, to the lower leg. Make sure we bunch that sheet up really good so that it's between their leg and the bolster. That limits any potential draping issue. And you're always good to make contact with like the tissue around the knee. Like I'll need and everything here closer to the knee, but starting out, you are best suited to use your forearms the closer you are to the pelvis and the hips. So that's where I'm going to pick orienting my arm, my shoulder into internal rotation, supporting the knee. I tend to be standing right in line with the knee, if not just a little bit below it. And then there you go. And then just play with your elbow angle. More acute, you'll be more on the hamstrings. The more you flatten it out, the more you'll be on the medial thigh muscles, which are called the adductors. Guess what the adductors do? <laughs> they, when they shorten, they adduct your hip. So some muscles aren't named so bad. <laughs> the upper part of the hamstrings extend the hip. The lower part of the hamstrings flex the knee. So the hamstrings, although we learn them as a group of muscles, there's three of them. Um, one portion of them is about extension of the hip while well, another portion of them is about flexion of the knee. And that's where they can have issues. Usually people have shorter hamstrings by their knee. That's where I focus my attention. All right, then just swap your forearm. After you've compressed the hamstrings and the adductors, take a step where now you're gonna be above the knee. 
can be superior to it. And then you can use the other forearm. Keep the angle of your elbow pretty acute so that you're coming in on the posterior side of the calf muscles. The big one is gastrocnemius. If we're doing these compression-based applications on the calves in this position, and then when we come over to the other top leg and we're doing those big knees, then we're twisting and bending them. So these muscles will get worked on twice, but just because you will focus your attention with compressions and glides in this orientation, which is easier on your body, and focus your knees more here, it, the muscle gets everything worked on. It's also a case where even just from a relaxation standpoint, each foot gets worked on twice. So this sets you up where if somebody wants that focus, it's really easy to just spend more time here. I'll cradle that foot. It's my left hand for the right foot. And then I come in with the forearm. Palms and everything are okay. Sometimes I change it up, but it depends on how much time there is. If I'm trying to use up more time, yeah. spending extra time on their feet, then I use palms, soft fist, but then still mostly forearm. And after we've done that, a way a little bit that I kind of use as a tactile element for I'm going to begin working on the foot. It's kind of a thing that I'll even use maneuvering on the table is grabbing the heels of the calcaneus and kind of giving them a good squeeze. Uh, rather than compressing right into the heel, it's kind of like I'm trying to pull the tissue away from the heel. I don't know if anybody's felt that, but my heels get real sore where I want them. It feels really good to have that pulled away from the underlying bone. That is one of my favorite things. Yeah, I love how it feels and it's doing a good thing, but pushing it right into the bone doesn't do anything. But So I'll use that when going around and prone. I'll squeeze the heels as I'm kind of getting from one side to the other. I'll do this as like a way to kind of start the foot massage. I'll squeeze the heel, I'll squeeze around the arch of the foot and the big toe. Then we'll go into massage. All the forearm and glides that I can do. Then I'll stop, give another good squeeze, sheet over top, another squeeze, and then we're on to the next. Okay. This leg, you want their foot on the bolster, not hanging off the edge of it. Everybody looks like they've done great. Okay, bunchy sheet, bunch, bunch, bunch. Scoot up, so we undrape the upper leg, ladder up a leg. If the foot is exposed, I can always use the sheets to come over and to cover that foot. Then here, we could do knees. We stand like this. There is a way to be able to kind of This uh, setup is just the table will kind of bump into your leg and give you some limitations, but you can work on this okay. It ends up not being a ton of pressure and also just applying a lot of force using your knees like this, but you can kind of feel like you're trying to lift that IT band up off and then give it a good bend. And then I, I tend to just support the knee with one hand. In this case, I'm using my right and then bring my left forearm. I'm working more on the anterior edge. If you want to swap up, you got to swap your feet. Very good. You're getting kind of the anterior lateral side of the upper leg, so the good chunk of the quadriceps muscles. You flatten out, you're going to be more an IT band. And after you give that a couple good squishes, work your way up towards the hip. You could get all the way to the hip flexors right on the front of the hip, but you're going to feel like you're reaching. So sometimes you might have to stop at a certain point. If you are limited purely in sideline, you can stop and then use a soft fist. And you want to be, you want to find that greater trochanter, you want to be just anterior to it. It's pretty high up. Like where the pocket of the pants would be. There, that looks better. 
I can do a much better job for these in the supine, but you could certainly work on a good spine here. Then switch your arms, support with the other hand, bring the forearm over, and then you can be on the slightly posterior side of the IT pen. Brilliant. Now, as we continue, some things aren't named too bad. So I had mentioned that these, these shin muscles, and that's kind of like what people tend to call, like this is the shin, right? Um, that's the tibia, that's the big bone, fibula. Look at what happens at the ankle though. The tibia flattens out and has a smaller uh, big bony landmark on the medial edge. Whereas the fibula, which comes down and makes up the other side of it, is much bigger. You can palpate these really easily. You'll feel like when you're palpating, usually what you think of is the ankle, you're feeling the distal ends of the tibia and the fibula. And then you gotta be below it to be truly feeling what the ankle is up to. But the fibula being so big, that acts as a barrier for movement. So that's why people roll their ankles typically medially. Yeah. And that's where things will get torn. So finding those, those bony landmarks are called malleoli. So it's a lateral malleolus and a medial malleolus. So when I feel those, even like I do a foot massage, let's say somebody had a really bad old uh, sprain, or maybe they had a plate put in or something like that, and there's a scar. Um, I would want to be right by that lateral malleolus, but not right on top of it. So then like where my, almost like the thumb pad portion of my palm will be where I focus the application a little bit. I can just pick the foot, yeah, I'll go that way. <laughs> and just pick that foot up, other hand underneath. Just cradle that arch and then just sandwich. <laughs> really can't go wrong. I mean, I think I've said this before, as, as you exist in a human body, it should feel like, you know, as you can find a way to uh, coordinate both hands working together here, just do what innately seems like it would feel good, right? In time, it'll be a case where you can start visualizing these actual structures. So that's what my brain is doing, is I'm trying to think and feel for how I'm making these tarsal bones move. I'm making these metatarsal bones move. And maybe my fingers are palpating a particular um, element in the arch of the foot. Let's say there's plantar fasciitis, so there's issues with the big toe. Maybe I find a tender point. You got a pop? <laughs> the rule of a pop as long as it doesn't hurt, it's usually okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And again, uh, for like elements related to squeezing, like I tend to grip right around because I said we don't want to compress the ball of the foot, but we can squeeze. Like I grab where I'm even hugging around the whole big toe. I'm trying to really focus my attention here. Squeeze, squeeze, and grab. What? It's a good uh, time. The sound effect really does it. Like God, Hulk really smash. It. Yeah. I'm trying to time my <laughs> But my hand is <laughs> underneath, so that way when I squeeze, my palm is moving into my fingers. With the sound effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that should create the effect it makes of it pulling better. the skin and the tissue away from the underlying bone. And that's sideline. The things that we did not cover, just because trying to limit the most important elements, which is really you being good at knowing how, obviously the legs have just nothing but advantages, but the, the neck, especially the base of the neck and the low back, these are essential positions if you're really going to be effective at helping people with major issues here. 
your tension headaches and migraine people, uh, if they really, now it can be intense, but this, the deep muscles that kind of cause or are related to those symptoms, they're very deep here. And this is the only way to really effectively address those. It's also the only way to really effectively address all of the muscles that could potentially be causing the low back symptoms or be associated with them. Things we didn't address too much is working here just because that will take a little bit more just awareness of the anatomy of making sure you're not too much on the scapula, not too much in the ribs, but there's some pretty important muscles right here. And um, even working in the arms in this position. So let's say we were limited in side length. Now working in the arms here really isn't that big of a thing. That's why I don't usually worry about it because it's just nothing but sandwiches. <laughs> I have to keep their arm from flopping because if I just did that, <laughs> Right, so I'm gonna to have to just support the arm. Support the arm. That ends up being the same application as a sandwich, but this will turn into the exact same body mechanics you need to be using for your needs. Don't, don't let the need not be a sandwich. <laughs> Where people hurt themselves is they stop paying attention to creating a more equal force and keeping their elbows straight. They start turning it into this. And that's where you'll get yourself. All right. Okay. Bolster out from underneath their knee. My personal routine tends to be prone for the torso, the arms, the hips. Now I don't do almost anything for the legs. I turn them on their sides and that's where the neck, head, more of the low back, the legs and the feet. With the legs, if we've worked on the lateral muscles of the lower leg, the shins, in sideline, we don't have to work on the lower legs at all, or the feet at all, in supine. This allows us to limit, especially an area where body mechanics can be a real struggle. I could, I could, Take a person's leg at the hip, really internally rotate it. We want to bolster. Always bolster. First bolster. Like this, in the case where you just prompt under the knee, and everything will go. Okay. Some people won't be able to internally rotate enough to be able to accomplish this, though. And this is a very big bolster, which gives me a better hill and everything. Now we could work here. You could drop down onto a knee and do stuff here. It is an option, but it's certainly not as effective or as good for you as just getting in sideline. So that is a way, but if you've done it in sideline, and especially the feet, this is atrocious. There is no really solid mechanical way to get the feet good in this position. There's plenty of therapists that learn how to do point work with like their thumbs and stuff here, but just save yourself that, okay? If you had to, you could take the leg, bend it, bend the knee, externally rotate the hip so that the arch, the foot, is more uh, set in a way that you can access it better. But that's the only real like solid option I have here, and it's still not ideal. All right, in this routine, all we really have left is the anterior upper leg or anterior thigh. Now one thing here, uh, create the bunch and go up as high as you effectively can, but we don't have to be creating wedgies and stuff <laughs> like that, all right? There are options of creating that lasso with the contour drape where you find the corner and you could put that underneath the knee and that could create some additional like um, security of holding the sheet down. I don't use it that often unless I'm doing a bunch of hip mobility stuff. Typically, the bunch is perfectly fine. Now once we're here, the important part is gonna be doing this. Just getting a hold of the whole leg. It's most important that we're making contact with the, the femur and 
getting acquainted with hip rotation again. We did hip rotation in prone by taking their leg, bending the knee, and going back and forth. Now we have their knee closer to extension, but we want to see how good is their internal and external rotation. I'm able to kind of rhythmically do that. Usually it's this. Usually all I have to do is kind of push on the lateral side of the leg. That'll cause the internal rotation, and then I let it just come back. I guess guide it back. You can make this turn into and feel like a nice rhythmic massage application. But what you should be paying attention to is how does the hip feel? Is everything moving smooth? Right? There's no crazy knocks or hard stop points, stuff like that. Then, most importantly, what we this will allow for is better positioning to get the structures of the thigh. The anterior upper leg has a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And they go in all kinds of directions. Like the superficial ones, this muscle and this muscle kind of create a uh, upside down V that splits at the hip and goes down. This one is actually the muscle that controls the tension of IT band. That goes all the way down on the lateral side of the knee. This muscle, which comes real close to sharing the attachment site with that other one, splits and goes on the medial side of the knee. It's like they conjoin here, split, and bracket on either side of the knee. Both hip flexors here, but then they have different jobs down here. Then you have the quadriceps muscles, which can you guess how many of those you have? Four. Yeah. <laughs> so all named vastus except for the top one called rectus femoris. So they are named for, there's vastus lateralis, that's rectus femoris, underneath of it is vastus intermedialis, and then there's vastus medialis. That's not so bad. But we have to get all of those and sartorius. For your trivia question, sartorius is the longest muscle in the human body. That covers the greatest distance. Yeah. Now, in order to access all this, I want to make sure I'm hitting the lateral, the anterior, and the medial portions of it. And rather than me doing all this, all I have to do is move them. I'm going to use my forearm in almost the exact same orientation, but I'm going to internally rotate the hip and hold it there. They're going to get it done. Nice turn. Their feet, their foot should be where the toes are at least pointed at the ceiling, if not a little bit more over. That way? Yeah. The internal rotation of the hip. Very good. So as you got to scoot them. Yeah. It's got to not kind of be a little bit, do it nice and slow. Don't be too gentle. Now, <laughs> So what are you doing with your tongue? Once we're here, mm -hmm. the other arm can come over, and this is where we want to be on, we're not going downhill like this. We're going on angles. This is the way, one, two, three. We get all those lateral structures. So vastus lateralis is the big one. We're kind of prying all these quadriceps muscles away from the IT band. Now, all I have to do is roll them a bit toward me, where feet, you know, toes slightly turned out. Now I do those applications all over again. Now I'm going to be more central, right on the anterior side of the upper leg, and I'm getting two other muscles. I'm getting rectus femoris and vastus intermedialis. Then you might have to bend their knee just a little bit, but turn their leg out so that the hip is externally rotated and do that action all over again. And now you're getting vastus medialis, exact same form. Maybe a little bit of the other adductors. Just watch you don't end up going too downhill. But with your elbows aimed towards the pelvis, see how you're pretty safe from like intervering contact? Yep, doing great. And there you go. And then you could just roll them, and then you could do that in any order. You could externally rotate and do the medial stuff first, and then slowly internally rotate them and turn them all the way over like that. But you can basically stand in the same place and get the meat and potatoes of this done with a forearm by just changing 
where their where their leg is at and you're getting all that hip mo motion at the same time the other place and then you're good to need just make sure your fingers and your orientation are slightly aimed towards their knee so that your fingers don't actually go like underneath the sheet or something like that but that works pretty good Very, very good. Very, very important area. Now I talked about a little bit related to the tensor fascia lata, because it tenses a lot of fascia. There you go. <laughs> Sartorius and then rectus femoris, the top quad, they all essentially conjoin right here at where the uh, pelvis is. And do I have it? There it is. Here's the pelvis. Ilium, pubis, ischium. Your hamstrings, for example, attach onto the ischium. Your medial thigh muscles, your adductors, attach onto the pubis. These muscles attach essentially right here. So here's the iliac crest. We call that the ilium. Iliac crest is the ridge. And then there's going to be these points on the front side and on the back side. So when you're feeling palpating like the, the uh, sac sacrum, you're getting that bony bump of the pelvis right there. It's a bit more subtle back here. If you've ever been to a chiropractor or had any other buddy palpating the pelvis or the sacrum, that's what they're feeling for. They're feeling for this if, they're, if you're laying prone. The other version is palpating here. Now, we don't need to be worrying yet about the pelvic girdle distortion, but what I'm trying to indicate is we're trying to be on the muscles that attach there. So I want to be really close to this. I don't want to be on it, but I want to be just below or inferior to it. I have options of how to identify where that is. Similar to in prone or sideline, if I can find the greater trochanter, then I can just go a little bit superior and a bit more anterior, and I'm right there. I can also palpate that, but I can use this to find that, all that kind of stuff. I suggest, based on the fact that we're already moving the hip around, that you use the lateral side of the leg, rotate that hip, track up until you find the greater trochanter again. Once you found the greater trochanter, it's about a 45 degree upper angle, and just see if you can find where that point of the pelvis is. It's about right here. Yeah. So now we want to be just below it. Same form you used during the uh, anterior leg application. You want to be right there. Now these can be pretty sensitive spots, so be mindful of your pressure. And then in order to create a little bit more, because this area sometimes can be quite difficult to drape appropriately, incorporating joint movement plus the application. So your hand's already there to move the femur underneath your application. It will get where you get a bit braver and more targeted. Now these hip flexor muscles are essential to work on. I will yammer on that another time. But assume everybody's stuck in a seated position. And the muscles that are short when you're sitting are always what are chronically tight. And if you don't work on the hip flexors, you're not going to help somebody's hips or their low back. All right, so we've worked on that, and we do a swoop. So yeah, this is where I use things like that, where I come around, kind of hug the feet, and I'll hug the ankle, hug the foot. There's some things where you could do here where you could grab underneath the heels and kind of just give them a squeeze and maybe a mild traction. I don't do a ton of that, but I mean, it's certainly a thing where you could kind of incorporate an element as you're moving from one place to the other. All right. Then to the other leg and then just replicate.
You can pick either one. Sometimes they're already externally rotated, so maybe it's easier to start that way. Mm -hmm. You just externally rotate them a little bit more, stabilize the knee, just hold it nice and fixed, and then massage, 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 or forearm, 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 then turn the leg a little bit. Turn it a bit more. Now you're already in a perfect position because if you stop at that last compression, you're probably pretty close to that greater trochanter. So if you can just go up a little bit further and identify where that anterior superior iliac spine is, that's that hook thing I was talking about. You can compress those hip flexors, move the leg a little bit back and forth, and voila. Now this is where you kind of want to even start your visual and but then not visual, your uh, appreciation that the first sessions are essentially assessment. And you want to be kind related to your expectations of what you can achieve and like, set your clients up for what's realistic too. That like we're going to identify things. Like I heard over here, like one side's a lot tighter than the other. <laughs> and the client can appreciate that. And so you can, um, once you get to know a person's body better, then that means future sessions are going to be more efficient because you're going to already, already have a little bit of a sense of where the areas of target are, right? Sure. So you have to be ready to say that, you know, the first session's a lot about assessment and, you know, in future sessions, we'll be able to get more and more refined and specific. We want to keep the first sessions more general more basic and more about that assessment. And then as we understand the body better and we understand their body better, we'll get more and more targeted. Okay, I kind of attached the arm again. Here's where uh, in finding the arm, best to just find their elbow or their hand. Undrape the forearm in their hand and then identify and get the rest of their, their arm out. Now, it is ideal to be able to access the skin on the anterior chest, but it is not essential. Sometimes, you know, a lot of breast tissue, it may just be in a position where you feel like it's more prudent to just avoid but typically things are can be out of the way. You don't need anything big. You don't need anything more than just a small triangle where you can see at least the front of the shoulder joint. I strongly suggest keeping their arm in, in, uh, in hand. <laughs> then I can position, I can use that to get the sheet tucked into their armpit because you know, you'll want it off the front of their arm. Yeah. There we go. Beautiful. Now, uh, over the sheet, or if we can, uh, just nudging the sheet out of the way enough. A soft fist works okay. The forearm is my favorite. We talked a little bit last week, but just making sure you're not on a clavicle. That's the only thing you have to watch out for. With the forearm, that's where the hand placement touching the table and then bringing the elbow over works really good. But the soft fist also is an option. And then you can incorporate some of the same rotation patterns, very similar to like what you did. Um, where at? Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Making sure you're not on top of good foot swap. Soft fist. Now you already have the arm in um, control. So after we do that, we can just step back, keep the arm in hand, and now the other hand can just act as a push hand, but instead of doing the pull with our hand, we can use their arm. So push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. We can step around and we could apply compressions more directly 
in line with the humerus while incorporating elbow extension and flexion. And forearms can go down. And then we're just doing those neat actions again. We've done some glides and stuff last week where you could stabilize the wrist and glide towards or compress towards the elbow. Or, and this is one place where I say going downhill is okay. My mother can yell at me later about it. Sometimes pulling the structures away from the elbow joint is more effective if we're talking about a tendonitis related issue at the elbow. Now here, more for the hands. Kneading again works so good on the forearms, I really usually suggest just using the knees as much as possible there. Now, the hands. We can grip on either side where I'm around the big, around the thumb, around the pinky finger, down at the metatarsals. We can use our fingers to kind of be going along. Now you don't want to be too much right here, central. And that's just the carpal tunnel and a bunch of tubes. But you can be a little bit targeted on this group of muscles and this group of muscles and give those a squeeze. I feel like you're kind of squeezing the pad of the thumb. But there's also a chunk of muscles um, just below and around the fifth metatarsal here around the pinky. A uh, thenar group and hypothenar group. As you kind of work your way up, and you can do a similar thing to what we did with the feet, but you can think about all those metacarpals. Did I say tarsal? I meant carpals. For the fingers, instead, as, as an option that limits your use of your fingers, like doing this kind of more delicate using index and thumb, if you use predominantly, predominantly try to use these three, and whether it's done tennis or golf, I appreciate that that's where you have your better grip strength anyway. So three fingers around one digit, three fingers around another digit, and then don't pull, squeeze. Pushing your palms into your fingers. And I promise you can squeeze about as hard as you possibly can, if not as hard as you possibly can. The squeeze will create a mild traction in these joints. And it's okay if there's a little click, but pulling aggressively, you should be very careful. You don't know what like an arthritis or a jammed finger and stuff like that. But the squeezes are very safe and very effective. So just squeeze and then move your way in to the ring finger or the fourth phalange to the index finger, the second phalange, and the same thing. Now your hands in between all the other fingers are creating a little bit of a stretch. Then middle finger, thumb, because the thumb usually needs more care anyway. Now I'll do a series of squeezes, like to start closer to the hand and work their way out, depending on the size of the other person's hands. And then you can throw in some other cool things if you want. Like there's all kinds of like options related to this, but this is one that's just kind of a bit more mechanical and easier to do starting out. Very safe, and I think it feels really good. Then we just gotta swoop around and pat it all over again. Find their elbow and or wrist, keep their arm in hand, Find, create just a small triangle so you can get just, just to the smallest bit there at the pec line, that's perfect. And soft fist, maybe to start just so you can get a better awareness of where everything is. If you incorporate the joint movement, you'll feel the head of that humerus. You can kind of get a sense of where you want to be. You don't want to be right on the shoulder joint. Forearm placements. And once you're to the upper arm, you can see how that creates a torsion, but you're not having to do this to cause it. 
And that's good, just make sure you don't get too much here on the medial arm, as long as you're careful. Everybody's being so brave, you're doing so good. You might even be a little bored. <laughs> Oscillation shaping. That's a good one. Hey, no, no, that's bull replicate. So this is a good one to incorporate. There's not a much better place to incorporate some ideas of oscillation and shaping. Now, if it's really uncomfortable for somebody laying there, it's fine, but rhythmic oscillation is a way to kind of override. It's a ton of sensation into everything, whether it be joint related or even the soft tissues around the joint. So you can rhythmically oscillate an area for long enough, it will decrease the tone of things, let alone the uh, create, you know, that stimulation of synovial fluid for the. Yeah, no, you don't be too delicate. Like really give it, you know, get the arm moving. It's the person laying there with responsibility. You usually let yourself be, let their arm come a little bit more out on the adduction. Not as much out here, stay a little bit more down here. I mean, you got to get that elbow and that shoulder going. You'll see by the way of doing this, I'm never snapping the elbow. You want to be holding the, 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 the wrist, not the hand. Marka, that's what's funny. I've been nervous there when you did this other arm. You would be very surprised. I've had plenty of per plenty of people where they have major shoulder issues, and massage application is way too sensitive. Yeah, trying to like go for a really targeted uh, release of something like deep in the rotator cuff. I can't do it because everything's just so tight and ouchy. Yeah. But rhythmic oscillation, like, oh, I think I'm gonna whether it be here more direct, and it just racking back and forth like that, that takes a lot of upper body strength and it starts to wear you out. Mm -hmm. But here, you'd be amazed. Or like this grabbing, so, like here at the hips. Yeah, I can feel it up in the middle. This rhythmic oscillation for a good long time, so the ankles are wobbling back and forth. I thought it was two years ago, it comes and goes. Okay. And again, here at the arm, remember that you can use this to create that torsion need effect. And then here, forearms, good hand massage. I mean, you're pretty much there. The big missing piece now will just be incorporating uh, working on the skin and lotion distribution. Less lotion is gonna be more advisable. You don't wanna be just slipping and sliding all over the place. So, pressure, the amount of pressure you use is a way to create a certain level of intensity, right? The more pressure you use, the more stress it's putting on the tissue course. Uh, but there's also how little lotion you use so that you're creating more tension effects on the skin and the superficial fascia. So mild fascia release and connective tissue based work pretty much rely on you using little to no lotion so that the stress creates more of a stretch or an elongation of that superficial fascia. So it's essential to know, be really good at working and doing massage with very little lotion but that will also have more of an intense sensation. Individuals that say they want deep tissue or they want aggressive massage, they want to be beat up. <laughs> Two renditions of creating that are with deep pressure or with less lotion that create more of that stretchy burning effect, which is more myofascial. The combined element of the two usually means you don't need as much of either. You can have good amounts of pressure using less lotion to create more tension on the, on the fascia, and now you're creating a sensation that's quite intense. And you're getting more done, but it's like a case like where you don't have to just be crushing, right? <laughs> uh, the more lotion, the faster you're gonna move, and the less intense it'll feel. Now to the last little bits with the head. I'm not gonna worry about uh, talking a lot about working with the neck in this situation. One thing though, people love work at the neck here and it can feel really good. So I'm gonna show at least one little option where instead of doing this, okay, I get it, I get it, 
distraction things, but I want to give you something that kind of limits the stress in your hands. Use one, one hand at a time. The, the pressure is going to be mostly focused on these, the middle finger and the ring finger. I'm going to go underneath. I'm underneath starting on the left side, but my pressure is going to be on the right side of their neck. Now, what I'm finding out of the spine is processes, and then I'm trying to put that pressure on those muscles right by the spine. But right here, you have pretty good finger strength usually doing this. And then the weight of their head is what can be causing most of the pressure. But I get to stand on one side, keep my wrist neutral rather than being like this. Stand on one side, They should feel like you're just trying to lift their neck up with those fingertips. And then as you, can, you can create a little pull. You know, try to use this like you would think about using your thumbs. The classical rendition, how people will like work on the neck. Doing, just try to use these two fingers instead of a thumb. Seeing if there's ways to kind of make that work all the way up to the base of the skull. It's a way to do this without even sitting, is the other nice thing. Then just holding fingers at the base of the skull can feel just really, really, really nice. Just feel for where there's bony prominences, the bony landmarks of the skull. Get on, try to be on the same ones on either side. Apply a little bit of pressure, doesn't have to be a lot, and just hold. This can be very soothing. Be amazing how soothing just long holds along the ridges that you feel at the base of the occipital bone are. And then swap hands. Now my right hand's going to go underneath and I'm going to work on the left side of their neck muscles. Okay, from there. And I will show other options, but just to help move us along. Um, and I, I swear to you that you're going to get the upper traps and shoulders way better in side lying anyway. Now uh, here's where we can do one final thing. You know, plant both palms right on that forehead, right on those frontalis muscles, and just good squish down to the pillow, <laughs> opening out and away. An esthetician will understand that most actions start at the midline of the skull, and then you're kind of pulling things out and away, and up and away. There's a lymphatic principle here, but usually you're creating a bit of a frowny face and then a surprise happy face. Mm -hmm. And then work your way up to the hairline. I squash at the forehead and then I work my way slowly up to the hairline. We could work a little bit more on the temples, But I tend to end things at some point, usually, especially like when time's limited, I just at least go right on the forehead, work my way slowly up to the hairline, working my way kind of to the crown, and then I do a bit of a swoopy, contact with the shoulders, come down, contact with the upper legs, give the hips a little bit of a rock, knees a little bit of rock, I'm balancing a chakra, ankles, hold of the ankles. This is a polarity thing. It doesn't have to be anything to use, it's just something that was built into my routine, and then I do a, a brush. And you'll see people do systems like that where they'll kind of do a bigger kind of it's an energy-based construct and principle, but it could just as be as much this, but I think there's something to having a patterned way you start your application and end it. Just pick something. It can be singing a weird song. And then, <laughs> you know, some tippy tappies. <laughs> so, tippy tappy. All right. And that's that.